I'm willing to make a wager with you at the beginning of the video here that humankind's influence system is probably a little bit more complex than you gave it credit for, and it probably does things that you don't quite realize. Let me take you through in this video why influence in humankind is more than simply a currency that you earn and spend on managing and acquiring land, but moreover, it shapes the very ideological structure of your society, not just from enacting laws and civics that can have massive impacts on your gameplay, but more broadly, it impacts the whole geopolitics of the game, including geopolitical decisions that you want to make, but also, more importantly, this is how humankind's ideology and civilization players will be very familiar with this concept, how humankind's ideology is shaped, and indeed, you can push your sphere of influence over others and force them to enact certain civics, enforce the sharing of technologies, and dramatically lower their stability. And of course, all of this can happen against you if you're not keeping on top of your own influence. Let's discuss in this video why humankind's influence system is complex. And once you understand it, actually not altogether very complicated, but man, it will have a massive impact on your game. Sit back and relax, and let's discuss. I'll have timestamps throughout, by the way, if you want to jump around and you're not quite sure on certain things or you know others already, but for starters I want to talk about acquiring influence in humankind. Influence is mainly produced by owning cities and territories. Each city has a main plaza, the central district, which generates a basic level of influence and the plaza can be upgraded with various techs and civics throughout. Beside that you can complete, say, certain cultural wonders to generate influence, and there are various legacy traits, uh, religious tenants, even some technologies actually that can produce influence for you, and of course various districts, the commons quarter most notably being a great source of influence. During the Neolithic age as well you can find curiosities which will give you a one-off influence boom, very useful if you're wanting to get out and claim territories. Because indeed, and let's move on very swiftly to spending influence in humankind, we're talking at the very sort of basic level, how do you spend this fascinatingly interesting currency that feels a lot like culture from Civilization V and Civilization VI. Well, broadly, you spend your influence just as you would spend money, spending it largely on things like claiming territories with outposts, right? To first establish that outpost, it'll cost you. It'll also cost you to upgrade that outpost into a city, attaching them together to create a sort of mega city as well, Crucially also, claiming wonders, proposing geopolitical treaties, right? So if you want to open up trade with another empire, it'll cost you. And crucially, and perhaps most obviously to a lot of us after we've settled our cities, we use influence in humankind to enact civics on the civics tree. This is humankind's take on civilization's culture tree. And broadly, it's a very interesting tree. There are other ways to spend it as well, for example, if you have some of humankind's independent tribes, these barbarians, dare we call them that, it's probably an insult, but we'll do it. The barbarians, you can also spend influence to either improve your geopolitical sphere of influence over them, or actually just absorb them, assimilate them into your empire altogether. As you can tell, there's a lot of pressure on one metric within humankind. One single currency of influence is responsible for so many key and important features, right? You can't grow big cities that are productive, that are producing lots of food, unless you first establish them with your influence. It's really fundamental, and it is the base rock, that sort of bedrock level of currencies in humankind, in terms of spending and acquiring, managing land and territories, and enacting those crucial geopolitical decisions as well, like wonders and treaties. But actually, folks, there's one more super important thing, and it sort of interrelates with the whole civic system. So as you know, when you're enacting certain civics, you are messing with the fabric of your society. These civics will twist you and turn you one way or another. Will your people move more towards that sort of communal, historically communist thinking, or will you move civics the other way along that axis, towards the individualized open market economies? These have many, many ramifications on all different yields, right? Certain uh, trees, certain civics will shift you more towards a combat focus or a food focus. 
So you know that by enacting certain civics, not only do you receive their innate bonuses, i.e. a trained army, a closed religion, but also you're more broadly messing with the very fabric of society. And this is how humankind's ideological system comes in, okay? You are literally shaping the ideology of your society when you're enacting these laws. There are other things as well in the game that will shift these. Uh, in particular, you need to pay attention when you're uh, accepting those events. Because the in-game events equally, and much like civics, not only give you some sort of one-off bonus, some extra gold or what have you, but also, they also mess with the balance of your society, tilting those axes from one way to another. So you have to take care because you may be inadvertently shifting your society in a direction that you don't want to take it. The reason why it matters is when you zoom out and look at the society screen. And this is where we move from thinking about influence as a currency to influence as your sphere of influence, your sort of social and geopolitical, indeed ideological, sorry for all the long words, your sphere of influence, okay? And just in case, <laughs> just in case you thought that wasn't enough, there's even more to it. Let's discuss the sphere of influence. So, a sphere of influence is a set of territories under your sort of cultural domination. And when you zoom out, you can see that some territories that you own may not be under your control. And indeed, the opposite is true. There can be territories that are owned by your opponent. They are governing them. However, your culture, your ideology, your society has control of them. Your sphere of influence extends beyond your borders in humankind's, but it can also retract and retrace within them. Indeed, if someone else is earning more influence than you, then over time, their territories will overtake your sphere of influence. Now, you might say, okay, so what does it matter? What does it matter if a territory, given that territories can only be a part of one empire's sphere of influence at a time, comes under the influence of another empire? Or vice versa, what if you managed to bring one under your control? Well, if you manage to add another empire's territory into your sphere of influence, you'll firstly generate a grievance, right? This sort of, this sort of like diplomatic hook, which can be used to either force some demands or generate war score, right? So these grievances are really important. They can feed war support for another civilization to attack you or feed yours to attack them. It's also, in general, therefore, really a pretty sound justification for going to war. There's no, however, direct, at the moment, economic benefit from having a foreign territory under your sphere of influence, unless you actually own it, in which case it's no longer a foreign territory, right? But including a territory uh, within your sphere of influence will let you then influence territories further afield. So it spreads, much like how religion spreads, your influence spreads as well. And you can tell when you zoom out and look at the society screen, you can see just how influential you are over given territories. Uh, it's worth, of course, stating that the re reverse can happen as well, right? Your territories can be swamped equally by this influence too. So do take care. Now, how does it matter in practice? Well, it's one of my favorite words of all time and it's called osmosis. Osmosis occurs both with technologies and with civics, and this impacts your stability. So, if you have territories that have fallen under another empire's sphere of influence, two things can happen. Some good, some bad. Technological osmosis occurs, and it triggers at various intervals, which can result in one of two things happening. You can learn one of your opponent's technologies for a monetary cost, or you can choose not to for a small tech boost instead. If the rival empire has no technologies that you're interested in acquiring, then osmosis can give you a larger one-off tech boost. Osmosis can also, though, impact your nation's sphere of influence in another way. If the similarity between your two cultures, your two societies, is too low, let's say you've gone all the way left on the social axis and they've gone all the way right, then you'll instead be prompted to adopt some of their civics. And indeed, this goes both ways. So if your influence is much lower and the empire next to you is very different to you, if their social structure is very different, then they'll start to force their civics upon you. And you'll be prompted to either accept the change. Okay, fine. We'll no longer be collectivists. We'll be individualists in this certain area. It'll force you to change your civics. You can either do that or refuse and take a stability penalty, 
which at first a negative 50 penalty may not seem huge, but as you keep taking these on, you'll find that the ideological pressure of being near an empire whose influence is higher than yours and whose society is very different can actually cripple your game. It can cripple you. So do take care and do zoom out and have a look at that sphere of influence and see just how well you're doing. It may be that you might not mind being forced to have your ideologies, your civics changed, and you might be happy to just roll with it. But in most cases, I argue it's really worth getting on top of your influence and trying to be influential at least over your core territories so you don't take those nasty stability penalties and so you're not forced to make civics and law legal decisions over your society that you wouldn't otherwise make. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope this makes sense and I hope it's given you a broad overview of how influence is not just a currency in humankind used to manage and acquire land, but more broadly, it's used to develop the very structure, the very ideological tenets of your society and how those are either pushed out across the world or unfortunately destroyed by impending pressure from others. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time for more hot humankind action. Take care out there, everybody.